Thank you so much. Good morning, folks. Uh, another Niagara resident here, or I've grown up in this area, so it's a, my pleasure to be back, and my family's from here, so I feel very proud for all of what's uh, happened here and all the growth of the Datathon. So thank you for, uh, for the opportunity to be with you again. I've got some esteemed panelists with me, and the subject that we're going to chat a little bit about has to do with the future of analytics and AI combined. And I know that uh, AI has overshadowed the analytics field an awful lot and put it on steroids in a nice way. Uh, we're going to talk about the cocktail of analytics combined, but before I do that, I'd love to introduce to you the panelists that I've got here. And what's interesting about it is we've got a range of industries at play, everything from financial services to minerals, right, which is interesting, and you'll hear about how that ties in to the technology field, to the commodities market. So we've got folks also who are representing companies today in that space, but who've also played across countries and across industries outside of that, and then across all kinds of different types of analytics. So we'll draw on some of their experiences, and it'll be a bit of a, I don't know if you know the show, like kind of Rick's Rapid Fire, because we've had a lot of espresso, and we are just going to whip through this and answer as many questions as we possibly can and alert you to the potential of analytics. And so I wanted to first introduce uh, Ernest Chan, uh, to use a head fund, hedge fund manager at QTS Capital Management, based in actually Niagara-on-the-Lake, so in your backyard here, and obviously in the commodities market. And he's an expert in the application of statistical models and software for trading currencies, futures, and stocks, which is an amazing field to be in, and one that's very AI-ready. He's built and traded a number of quantitative models for investment banks and hedge funds combined, and he's got a lot of international experience with individual and institutional clients and brings 25 years' experience to bear, so welcome. Thank you. Sarah Sun, who's Chief Data Scientist at Goldpot Discoveries in the mineral exploration field, specializing in AI for mining, and she's a statistician with 12 years' experience in the analytics space, looking at information from a number of different angles, including payments, lending, and more recently, obviously, the geology space, which is cool, uh, various roles across companies like Microsoft, TD, and Cap One and passionate about advocating for analysts in pursuit of opportunity, being women in analytics or female entrepreneurs, the application of AI and how it transforms our future. And she's also the coach of a math team uh, Canada at the International Math Opiate. So welcome. And James Lee. Uh, partner in crime here over at CIBC, I'm at BMO, uh, Director of Big Data Services uh, in the financial services space, obviously, and Big Data and AI and ML solution designer and developer and a skilled cloud service enabler, uh, experience across B2B, B2C, including telecom, e-commerce, retail, uh, grocery, FS, and uh, addressing, obviously, a range of business challenges within this space, including digital campaign optimization, customer uh, CRM, and the whole gamut, and also the co-founder of a couple of startups. So welcome. And finally, last but not least, uh, a friend, I think, of the Brock Datathon and someone, a face that you should all recognize is Bob Lytle, who's president of Related, a technology firm and a seasoned data and analytics uh, expert with 20 plus years experience across a number of fields, inclusive of financial services, sports, government, uh, across Canada and the US, with deep expertise unlocking credit potential through analytics and enabling that with technology, and currently spends a lot of time uh, bringing big and open open data and due diligence to financial insurance and government markets through related. So welcome. And, and my name is Lori Bita. I head up the Data and Analytics Center of Excellence at BMO and have spent, uh, probably I'm dating, my, uh, dating myself here with Bob, but an, uh, over 25 years experience in the data and analytics space. Uh, across the globe, across industry, and uh, an awful lot of time uh, mining if different information across different firms and, and Fortune 500 organizations. And so the role today really is to help kind of illuminate where it is that we're at, and more importantly, where we're headed. And we're going to leave some time at the end for questions. And uh, as I mentioned, we're going to talk about the whole cocktail of analytics, not, not uh, exclusive to just AI, because obviously we're playing in that space. And so I wanted to ask our panel, just out of the gate, when you think about two words which you think will characterize the future of analytics, just two, what is it? Shoot, Bob, can I head to you? Um, when I look at a trend, I'm always looking at how, where you know, the capital, the money moves. So when yeah. I look at startups uh, for the next of the future, uh, there are two uh, very hot areas. One is about data. You know, data is always the challenge. So you see uh, MongoDB and, um, and uh, some other you know, new startups for data. And the other is uh, machine learning called AutoML. So it's about automation, machine learning, and AI. So just two words. <laughs> so I would say social change, the impact of not only data, but looking at the data and how that touches our lives, not 
only in how we work, um, but frankly, whether all of us work. It's a big discussion now in the US presidential campaign. Do we have any members of the Yang gang here? There may be a couple, there's one, there's one I know. Oh, it's Ed, isn't that funny? Um, so the idea that we may actually automate a lot of us out of productive employment because the machines can actually do so much more and so much faster. Right, so social change, yeah. is that awesome, makes sense. Um, well, my, my thinking on this is that uh, machine learning will be easy and data science will remain very hard. Um, and the reason I say that is that um, machine learning, um, you know, there are a lot of people working on the same problem both in academia and in industry and most of the problems can, are f highly general, generalizable. So you can develop deep learning methodologies, uh, interpretable models, and those are all publicly available information and they are generally applicable on a large variety of problems. And so major advances can be made very efficiently. And uh, for example, in, in our uh, own research, we hardly ever develop our own machine learning algorithm. You just pull it out from the open source libraries and so forth. So machine learning is fairly easy. You know, they, are, they can be, in fact, completely automated, as AutoML, uh, you know, uh, James su suggested. But data science, on the other hand, is a highly um, domain-dependent problem. And um, you, know, there's, you cannot really automate it. I, for, for now, I could not see how one can automate uh, you know, cleaning a specific data set. They all have their own uh, quirks and they all have their own kinks. And it is an extremely time consuming, labor intensive right, so problem. So you see this polar extremes. That's Yeah, that's I get right. it, yeah. Yes. So, all right, thanks. Um, you know, if you are a data scientist, I don't think your job will be in danger in any time soon. Awesome, thank you. <laughs> I'll be really brief. To me, the future of analytics, it's really convenience and connection. So convenience because all these data science tools, everything around you, think everything in your life is already driven by AI, whether you recognize it or not, and it's only going to become more so in the future. And I always say connection, because the ability of using computers, let's let, allow the algorithms to do what they're fantastic at, reading thousands of pages a minute, doing the OCR. Uh, understanding the risk of certain securities or certain actions, and that allows us to connect on a more human level. Yeah, no doubt. We, we're, we're in for a ride, folks, right? There's a little bit of social change elements in there. There's obviously government aspects. There's the whole talent technology transformation aspect, the role that technology plays versus people, and we'll get into some of those themes. And when you think about uh, the usage of analytics in organizations, I'm curious of your thoughts around the one thing that differentiates those companies who you think will excel in the future. And, uh, and, and jump in. And I'd love to hear from you if you wouldn't mind. Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, let me uh, have You're the first nodding, shot. that's why I'm looking at you. <laughs> uh, yeah, you may think about vision, you may think about technology, but I, I choose the culture um, because culture is about how people behave. Um, when I'm seeing from the company, uh, it's always the people, you know, whatever, no matter how great your vision or how mature technology is available in the market, but the final is how people is going to accept it and execute it. Uh, so in the, in, in the company, we always seem, um, well, some people, they are very, um, you know, warmly embrace new technology, uh, but some people, they don't. Um, so that's always when we're going to say, you know, we are called as an innovation bank or transformation bank, uh, but we need people to execute. We need people to cooperate. So I would choose Yeah, it makes culture. sense, culture, big deal. Yeah. yeah, Bob, how about you? So a good friend of mine highlighted that the most important thing is not the quality of your algorithm, but the quality of your decision. And in order to make a good decision, you need to understand the social aspect, you need to understand the culture, but you also have to understand the context in which you live. So think of the day when everybody can make a model immediately. Stefan said, hey, you can install it in five minutes. Well, what happens when anybody can install a new model in five minutes? The companies with AI is every company. So now, how do you win? You win by making a smarter, better decision. And most times, it doesn't have to do with the technology. It has to do with the thinking and the historical context of the people who are making decisions based 
on the data. So I look less at the algorithms and more at the smarts of the folks who are actually taking those outputs of algorithms and making something smart happen with it. Well, um, you know, my perspective is, of course, formed in the investment uh, industry. And there's a, a specific problem in applying AI in making investment decisions. And the problem is that the humans are actively trying to defeat AI in that industry. Uh, whereas in other industry, you know, let's say you are applying AI to a self-driving car, um, you know, nobody is actively trying to fool the system of the self-driving car to go into an accident, right? There's no active adversary to a machine learning system. Whereas in the investment industry, there are numerous adversaries to an AI system whether the opponent is an, another AI it's system. It's classic analytical arrogance, right? It, it's exactly. analysts competing with analysts, analysts competing with technology. That, that is right. Yeah. And so, um, you know, a typical AI system learn from the past, but unfortunately in the in investment arena, uh, the past is no prologue of future because they are active opponent trying to defeat your strategy. So that remains the biggest problem of, it's almost a game theoretic system where you have to out uh, think out forecast your opponent, and that's very okay, hard for thanks. AI. For me, it's really about realize, real, realism. Sorry, can't speak today. It's a little early. <laughs> realism, and as well as a company's ability to fail with purpose. So much of what we're seeing in my world, the adoption of artificial technology sorry, inside the mining industry, is that the expectations of what AI can actually do versus what they think it's going to do, those are leaps and bounds and worlds apart. And so those, and especially companies that are looking to innovate for the first time and they're really struggling to adopt, if they don't have a true understanding of what it means, what can AI, what can data do for you, and they, they don't understand that, these are, they come up with massive failures and they're not learning from any of those lessons. Yeah. And, and I would comment from my own company's perspective and even in my own department, we run about 1,300 pieces of analytics in any given year of various ranges, even just in our own shop. Of that, a fraction of which are AI-based, which I would contend is quite similar to many folks. Uh, and so in that vein, I think some of the things which would differentiate one into the future is making a choice as to where you're gonna play. Because you, you could analyze and you could machine learn any number of things, but if you, if you put your energy in the wrong thing, the P&L ain't gonna move. The customer's not gonna be happy. So I think it has to do with choice and attachment to the strategy. Uh, because it's not R&D for R&D's purposes. It's like getting the P&L to move, you know, offend, you know, making sure that you've got the right cybersecurity parameters in place, making sure the customer is satisfied. So it's, I think it's choice uh, in, in, our, in our perspective. And some of those things, I think, come to bear. And so it's interesting, right? And I think there's a lot, there's a lot of buzz around AI, the popular... Um, popularization of AI has made analytics kind of go on steroids a little bit. And everyone's like, oh my God, you know, this is the sexiest job on earth. I mean, truth be told, it has always been. I don't know where we've all been, but it has always been the sexiest job on earth. Uh, it's just now people are sort of paying attention. And what's what I find interesting is AI adoption has not been at the rate that we had all expected, or I think the world is expected. I think those of us perhaps in the trenches see that it's perhaps at the rate which we expect, because it's tough, right? It's tough to train a data set, it's tough to set up parameters. So when you look at that, um, give us your quick reason. If you had one reason as to why it's not been as quick as, as one had expected it would be, the adoption, what is that? You don't all have to answer, but chime in if you feel comfortable. This is a pet peeve for me. Uh, if there's, in my mind, it's the media. It's the way we talk about AI, it's the expectations, the number of times someone has sent me another Medium article or another YouTube video on how to build a stock market prediction so it's the bot. difference between what the media thinks and the reality of your own company? 100%. Like in your own company, why hasn't it been as quick, the uptick has been as quick as you'd hoped? So within our own company, so we are a startup that specializes in artificial intelligence. So we are built off the idea of technology. So we don't have problems with adoption internally. We have problems with adoption in the industry and with clients that we're trying to convince why AI is the future of their industry, not, yeah, not just everything. And how about, that perspective. Yeah, okay, great, thanks. James, how about you? Uh, for, for the AI adoption, you know, I once worked for consulting and now I'm working for the bank. Uh, based on my, my observation, it's, all, it's always about people, I mean, the talent. Yeah. Um, even, even, to be honest, even some project, even not started yet, 
uh, we can expect is going to fail, or finally the project is going to be just like Project Zombie. Uh, that means um, for AI project is very new, right? We, we did find the right people to be there, and um, we did find the right people to execute it. Um, actually, in Lori, I think you, you can answer the question, because I, I read an article uh, from oh, uh, MIT Slow Management. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned about talent. Yeah. So maybe you, maybe you a bit. Yeah, my, my perspective on this, I think what I called it a talent technology transformation, I think there's this idea of, or the expectation in the world of the rate at which technology is going to to take over that which uh, which we currently do, like the work that we currently do. And there's this expectation it's going to rise and rise and rise and rise at a certain rate. But in order for it to do that, in order for the processes to be automated, and in order for it to take over all that which the people are doing, it needs people. <laughs> and there's not enough people, because there's a global analytics talent drought. So it's actually kind of hilarious, because you have insufficient number of people, and you have technology that's perhaps able, but they're, they're going like this. So we're in this really unusual space where it's sort of a supply-demand issue, really, when you think about it in its most basic form, where the world wants more of something you cannot give it, and the people who are poised to train our models and set up all the parameters are, you know, perhaps the people in this room and the people up here, and there's just not enough of them. And that, as well as we're perhaps not ready to unleash all of the potential without the proper guardrails. So I think we're in this very interesting space. I don't see that the future looks like that indefinitely, but I just think we're in a little bit of a lock stop, right? And so hence, I think the AI adoption has been a bit slow. My view, when I kind of model it out in my own brain, I think we're a bit stuck uh, as an as a industry, an analytics industry at the moment. My two cents. It's actually good news for you, uh, everyone. <laughs> yeah, yeah you're, hot, you're, not, you're employed for a little while longer. And the one question I'd wonder about, and perhaps those in the room too, is where have you applied, and it doesn't necessarily have to be AI, I know we're leaning that way, but where have you seen analytics applied for the greatest gain? And not without revealing all your P&L factors, but where have you seen it applied? So something we're involved in here of late is taking location data mm -hmm. and public information and using it to do simple things like predict where people live based yeah. on where their devices are. And um, more interesting esoteric things like predict the risk of an individual uh, who may be on the wrong side of the law and how they connected with other people using nothing but public data. So what's interesting about that isn't the freak out of, oh my God, Big Brother's watching, but how do you actually make enough assessments and decisions that would allow you to do just as good as a police detective might do? Yeah, because that's really smart. what you're battling. It's artificial intelligence has as its archetype the human brain, right? Not yeah. something bigger than the human brain, but we're not even close to where a decently smart police person, police officer, or hockey coach could be. Why don't hockey coaches sit with their pads and do their numbers and so on like the stockbrokers yeah. might do? Because their gut tells them how to win the game a lot better than the algorithms do. Yeah, so smart. Eventually, you'll get good enough, or maybe you'll be almost as good as the best hockey coach Right, but we're a long way from there, much less kind of in this kind of scary. Uh, no doubt, other and Ernest, in your space, obviously it's changing and dynamic. But where have you seen the great? If you had to play in a place, and if you played in that place into the future, would it also pay out? Well, I think that uh, actually many people have come to realize in the industry that risk management is where the sweet spot is. Yeah, I find the learning. same thing. Yes, um, as yeah. I said, if you are trying, you know. Historically, everybody was thinking of, oh, how do I uh, find arbitrage opportunities? How do I find offer in an investment yeah. portfolio? That turns out to be very hard using machine learning. But on the other hand, risk management is something that, uh, you know, it, it is not a zero-sum game because uh, everybody investment strategy is different, but uh, the, the way that you apply machine learning to eliminate risk is not in competition with other people. Nobody can yeah. can can steal your risk management away from you. So that's yes, but it enriches your own PL. Exactly. Yeah, and basis points matter greatly. I get that totally. I find the same thing, by the way. Great. It's the amount of credit you outlay at what price point, but you, it's in, it's a game of increments, which is fun. I mean, it's intellectually stimulating, but you you start making those adjustments, good lord, like the, the sky opens up. <laughs> I mean, you can't explain it to your parents. My father thinks I work in a branch. <laughs> but it's very interesting to do, right, when you're doing those calcs. Awesome. Thank you for that. 
Um, and then I wondered just if you had to highlight, and not that it's a technology parade and we're not, we're not trying to promote any one technology, but we often get asked this question. And if you, from a technology stack perspective, whether it's hardware or software that you've used or tested or looked at, or if, you, if there's one thing you couldn't do without, right? One thing, what would it be? One type of technology, anything, just name it. It could even be your own. Bob. But well, you know, people ask me that all the time, and I'm curious what your thoughts are. Yeah, when we look at the the future of AI, right? It's um, you know, if you look at the key components, uh, if you look at AI workflow, uh, you know, we need data, and we need some AI tooling or algorithm to run it, and finally for PNR, PNL, yeah. we need production, we need automation uh, to support business to make the money. Um, so look, actually, this is a, a platform. I mean, including software and hardware. Um, but if I choose one, I would choose data related. Mm -hmm. um, this is where we can start. Maybe you don't have uh, some super uh, AI tooling. Uh, you can still use some very basic uh, to, to build some predictive modeling. But without data, you can do nothing. So, so I would choose a component as data. You get a smart answer. How about you, sir? Oh, go ahead, Bob. No, you got the mic. Go ahead. Here. Uh, for me, it's some. So I have two answers. One of them is something that I can document with. Uh, documentation is. I actually think it's a really, really big deal, and we as an industry don't do enough. Uh, uh, it doesn't, I actually don't care. I do not care whatever gets the job done that my data scientist is most comfortable with within the company it's GitHub, right? Um, and then from a hardware perspective, I literally, whatever computer my data scientist feels mo most comfortable working on, that's the computer that they're gonna get. I actually think if you're comfortable working with that, everything else, everything's gonna change. R, SAS, Python, one, we're moving to, we're moving, we're, everything is changing so quickly. So something that you're comfortable and then something that you can document with. Great, thanks. Bob, you wanted to weigh in? Sure. I wrestled with this and won a bunch when you sent me the question, Lori. <laughs> um, and here, <laughs> I, I, what I would say, as an employer of a lot of people from Brock, the thing that's most important to us is also what we learn the least of here, which is yeah. the Linux operating system. And it has nothing to do specifically with analytics or AI, but the ability to operationalize data, gather it, process it at scale, stand up a new AWS, or now we're using IBM Cloud Server, and to be able to jump onto that machine effectively requires the use of the command line. And it's interesting to me, even today, how few people come out with really strong Linux skills, that is what I have to teach almost everybody who comes and joins awesome. our company. thanks. And a lot of it's kind of getting back to basics, right? It's making sure that we've got the right foundations. I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and journey us as we think about kind of future of AI and a lot of, of what we're talking about around privacy, the guardrails, the inherent biases in the data, some of the things that freak the public out when they think about popping stuff into a machine and letting it have its way with us. And so when we talk about that and we talk about the subject of this kind of great debate, how are you managing for this and kind of risk-proofing for the future. I'm curious, Ernest, about your point of view on that one. Well, um, most of the data that um, you know, the investment industry used so far have been public data, mm -hmm. uh, and so they are anonymized, and there's not much of a privacy issue. But I know that um, you know, as people are seeking more and more exotic uh, offer an exotic data, some of these data may now contain, uh, may not be personally identifiable, but certainly on a corporate company level, uh, you know, for example, satellite images of um, a certain oil tankers, a certain yeah. parking lots of the uh, of, uh, department stores and so forth, they become more and more specific. And that's where um, the the issue of, uh, of privacy become more important. So. Um, there is recently a, um, uh, a white paper being published by uh, a firm called uh, WeWe in Toronto mm -hmm. that actually addressed this problem, namely that uh, it is actually, um, you know, uh, that the, uh, the investment industry should adopt the same sort of privacy standard as the medical research industry in trying to um, not use any specific information to generate offer, that they should uh, they should have a uh, committee uh, to uh, actually screen 
for the suitability of certain data set that we view. Sure. Yeah, non-PII. And obviously, James, you're dealing with non-PII okay, data on an ongoing basis and the protection of it. And it could well be that, or it could well be just general biases in data and offering credit granting and that sort of thing. And I know you have experience in that from a TU perspective, too. Do you want to weigh in on that one, James, and how you're kind of tackling that thorny problem? Yeah, you know, very interesting. Uh, I once worked at data scientists. I don't understand why technology always spend much longer time to deal with the use case. Uh, we always think, hey, data is there. You know, we already built the model, and it will be easy for you to implement for the technology team. But now, you know, I'm working technology team. I don't understand why. Uh, you know, we're at a bank, right? We have all your personal information, PII data, and, um, and it's about money. So we have zero tolerance about data leakage. So that means for all the AI project and some other you know, new application, the first thing we will think about is security. So we need to think about you know, the whole process. Uh, we have to define a good um, identity access management uh, to security guarantee the right people to access your data and to access the inside. So this is always uh, you know, the first thing is security. When we implement the ID system, um, in the in the data works. I mean, th this world is going to blow up, right? It's not just the financial data and the, the stuff that we're charged with managing. It's it's things from your DNA and and genome sequencing and all the stuff you do with that and the information on your phone and then like the collective trust about what one knows about an individual hoisted up somewhere into a cloud and then the fact that we're all very vulnerable to be hacked mm -hmm. and uh, and and obviously th that's just kind of data issues. I relegate that up, I'm just data issues. But then it's being able to, to plow that into a model to be able to make determinations off of it. And we live that every day, but I think we're susceptible as, a, as an industry to all sorts of, 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 of things as we go forward. And I think our prior speaker was talking about the need for openness, the need to be able to understand what's inside the model, the need to crack things open so you can understand how decisions are made off of that which we have the privilege of mining you know, the stuff that actually truly is ours to do. And, and feel free to weigh in on that one. I know obviously you're in the mining space, but formerly you'd spent some time with financial services data, which is more sensitive to. Yeah, no, um, I think one of the things that surprised me when I moved into the mining space is actually ethics and privacy is actually a really big deal. Um, mm -hmm. Our geologists will lose their license if we are doing unethical things with it. Uh, and so, and that is a governing body yeah. that is, is regulated. Uh, for me, one of the ways that we protect against this, and I, I think it's a great way to protect in the future, is actually the diversity of my team. Um, the teams that we're bringing together, they're truly diverse in education, experience, backgrounds, um, and it's, it's more than just, you know, what you can do. The, everyone brings a different viewpoint into it, and as a result, that collective viewpoint of, like, I don't think this is an appropriate use of this data, that, that is an important discussion that needs to happen up front every time there's a different use case. No doubt. Did you want to weigh in, Bob? challenge you to think about two dichotomies, and many of us are, are data scientists or algorithmic people here. Privacy by design means that you start with as little as possible and as protective as possible in order to accomplish your goal. Good modeling says give me every data column. Right, so if you think about what we want to do from a discipline perspective, we would want to have as little data as possible. Ask any one of your modelers how much data do you want, say give me every column, right? The second dichotomy is Facebook was accused a year ago of misusing private data and, oh, this is terrible, everybody got upset. How many users did Facebook lose? None. Practically none. Nobody bought into the shutdown Facebook. Why? Because we want somehow to give our data, even if we rail against the privacy issues. So until the consumers actually don't want to share their information, it's very difficult as a data processor to say, well, I guess I won't touch that consumer information. The rules get in the way, if you will, or the rules guide us because GDPR or PIPEDA or the new one in California is going to define what happens in Canada. I believe, if you want to research it, CCPA declares the right of an individual consumer to say, forget me, get rid of my stuff, don't process my stuff. And any company who touches consumer data will have to comply with that. And I think it comes in two years in Canada. Yeah, no, I think we're in, we're in for a ride on that one. And we've got 10 minutes left, so ready yourself for some questions. We'll open it up in a few moments. The final subject I wanted to touch on is one that Ernest raised and one that's uh, near and dear to my heart, too, is around 
kind of the role of the machine and the role of the, the talent, so kind of talent versus technology. And there's this belief set, of course, that you know the future of analytics and the future of many industries, frankly, will be kind of taken over by the machine. Everything's going to be put into a machine and it's going to be AI'd and our jobs go away. And then there's just sort of this reality when you, when you stretch across and you look at the type of an, a, analysis from BI all the way through to predictive and prescriptive analytics, all, you know, all the way through the gamut. Who's, who's going to do what? You know, are the analysts going to be uh, relegated in, in a good way to being doing higher order analytics? And, it, and is the AI work going to be able to consume kind of the lower end, like the traditional BI? So what happens? Like, it's kind of like analytical optimization, meaning like where does the analytics go? What, where does, what does the machine take over? And what, uh, what is taken over by the people? And, and what does that look like? And so I'm curious about your perspective on that one, because you touched on it a little bit. And I think about that an awful lot too, just managing thousands of pieces of output. And I'm trying to think, okay, how am I going to, I feel like a nurse in a triage center a lot of times, <laughs> uh, making sure everything gets done. And what am I going to push to a machine versus a person? Well, I think that um, uh, the analysts will actually, should, should actually welcome this development of um, having AI as a tool to help them. Because um, AI cannot create features out of thin air. The, the yeah. input to an AI algorithm uh, we main, re, you know, requires domain expertise. And so where does this domain expertise come from? It's coming from the analysts. You know, the domain expertise is as important as ever, um, you know, especially in the investment and management industry. Now, it is maybe not um, uh, as much, in, and I'm certainly not an expert in self-driving cars and, and, uh, and other uh, applications of AI. Maybe in those cases, uh, you know, you just need to capture uh, images wherever you can or yeah. capture radio, uh, radio graph whichever you can, uh, and you don't need as much uh, human expertise to uh, create features out of those um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, input to a deep learning model, but that is not the case in finance. You cannot just randomly capture prices and you know, uh, balance sheet information and just stick it into a deep learning network and hope that it will come up with a great uh, uh, risk management or arbitrage model. Yeah, so you're seeing that the data scientists are kind of hanging off, off to the right doing more sophisticated stuff that requires a domain expertise and the machine's hanging out on the left. That, that, left, that right? is right. So you at, see the same thing, James? Yeah. Yeah, what I would say, uh, machine learning and human learning. Yeah. Uh, machine learning, that means something you can automate. For example, data, you, know, you can build a, a, a good pipeline to automate, to collect data and, uh, and consume the data. And for, for, for machine learning, you can um, you know, automate some ML, ML, right? So about human learning, you know, as, uh, as early uh, Stephen uh, presentation, you know, in his presentation, 80% data is still not, you know, so need to be understand. Yeah. And uh, we need domain knowledge to understand, um, you know, where to get data, what data we need, and especially we have to deal with business, right? Because business is the st stakeholder. When they invest in the, in the project, um, ask we deliver. We need to deliver the value to them. So we need to understand their business requests. So domain knowledge, human learning uh, in the future, actually we're will take more significant role than machine learning. Yeah, fine. Any final quick thoughts? You good, Paul? And Sarah? All right, I'm going to open it up to the, to the room for any questions on kind of future of analytics and tap into the brains of our experts here. We can go in any, any direction, and we're are happy to take your comments. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. And thanks for the present, <clears throat> the panel guys. Um, I just wanted to say um, uh, to hear the mining space uh, come up a couple of times. Like I, I work at the mining industry as well, and I think of it as an industry that's pretty uh, resistant to change. Um, maybe that's not the right word, but uh, my question is, um, like, what what kind of arguments can you guys make that are persuasive? How how do you leverage? Like, do you leverage? Um, like we spoke about profit and loss. Um, do you leverage like the insight, the the, the benefit that your um, that your service will provide, or? Like yeah, I think you're a, you're I'm, I think you're a little bit more generous with the mining industry than than I am because they are very resistant to change, and I am thrilled coming to these kind of events because what I see here is the future, the next generation uh, that are open to and honest about what technology is and how it is. But we're talking to clients who are scared about what we do, and I still get this comment very often, which is, I do not want my firm to work with you because you're going to take my job. 
Uh, this is the number, the, where I actually see the most benefit of applying AI is taking somebody like that, going through the process with them, turning them into a believer because they suddenly realize that their skill set is still very, very valuable, and this is just another tool to help them. It makes them faster, it makes them much, much more efficient, uh, and it's great when their executives come, and come down and say, listen, if you use these tools and you're give, we're giving them targets of where to find gold or copper in the ground, uh, that gives me more confidence to give you money for the next stage of this project because you've proved to me that it's more than just your intuition, the data and the technology also agrees with you. Mike's coming. Um, you guys touched on um, data analytics and the privacy involved and whether the you know the customers or whoever they want to give out their data and everything. And I believe Mr. Chan said that if you're a data scientist, your future is looking good in the, in, in, in the career aspect. But I, I want to ask you is like, what about the cybersecurity professionals? Are, is there any innovative technology that's happening over there? Because again, like it's big data and you've got IBM coming up with DB2, which is an AI database and everything. So does it mean like there's more need for security professionals as well? And if and I believe that um, you're looking for Linux uh, graduates with Linux skills and uh, command line, but are you also interested in people who are, you know, more into security of data and everything like that, or is it just like handled by the IBMs and the Amazons that are more interested in such professionals? Oh, no, yeah, great question. I'll, I'll take a little bit of that. In part of my team, we, we look at uh, cybersecurity matters, fraud, uh, and in a prior life, I'd had a chance to work with various areas of government around the world on protection of, of data and kind of algorithms in, in an effort to, to manage some of that. So when you look ahead and you look at irrespective of companies, uh, and you mentioned a few, it's one of the fastest growing areas of uh, analytical advancements. F for bad reasons, obviously there's folks out there who are quite skilled in being able to try and penetrate uh, the, the greatest asset that, that exists within companies, which is data and leverage it and they're they're very clever right the, and I when I've studied from a, when I worked at SAS running their customer intelligence area I'd study kind of patterns of data and advancements across industries theirs tended to be the fastest because um, folks within that space uh, really devote an awful lot of time to try and figure out how to penetrate areas so I see an awful lot of advancement in the cybersecurity threat and the kind of threat detection space and they've classically grown up um, kind of managing almost in a verticalized way and they're having to obviously look across entire companies for threat actors that are are penetrating companies in more dynamic ways than you'd ever expected. And obviously with bots, with um, what's happening around the world in terms of coordinated attacks, it's becoming more complex to detect, which is uh, interesting, but at the same time very tricky, right, when you see that sort of thing happening. So when you look, when you, when you study where it is that you want to invest your time, perhaps you're coming at it from the perspective of where to invest your skills, an amazing area. There's companies like Palantir, Mandiant, many of those folks who are very, very deep in that space, uh, who are looking at kind of all sorts of things around IP detection and different things with nets and uh, neural nets and, and uh, machine learning models t with, with specific emphasis in that space that is pretty wild. But it's a, it's a massive area of focus for any company who, who has coveted data at their helm. A really interesting space analytically, but uh, obviously something that's near and dear to all of us as we protect PII. That's a great question. Thank you. Any other comments? We've got a couple left. Oh, yeah. Yeah, actually, you no. Know, just like a couple of months ago, I had a proposal about AI-driven uh, cybersecurity uh, for the bank. I uh, you know the big challenge, you know, as uh, Laurie mentioned. I uh, know first thing, you know, we are going to cloud, and the second thing. You're seeing a digital payment, a modern payment, a modern payment. So that means uh, it's not only everything in your network. You have to expand the data movement and everything across different networks. Could it be internet, could it be a mobile phone, could it be anywhere, right? So how to protect customer privacy, how to protect that is our big challenge. And the good, good news is, you know, as we mentioned about AI, uh, we see if you know technology something, you know, um, every where the data movement or some user to use some apps, you are 
you will leave some, you know, um, we call it logs, right, to tell who come here and when and what they do, right? So based on this information, we can use AI to, uh, to uh, find some patterns, to find some anomalies, and to give the security team alerts. So that means before any damage cost, we can find these bad guys, and we can find them out and stop them. So this is a great area. If you have interest in this part, in the, in the, in the coming years, this will be a very hard job. I think you'll see, uh, you'll see a lot more by way of collaboration in that space too with exogenous data and people want willing to collaborate more than ever before to be able to stave off impending threat. I know we're at the top of hour. I think there, there's a 10 more. Okay, we have time for a couple more questions. Oh, we have a lot of them. Uh, it's like a bloody game show. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Hi. I, I had a question more about the industry, how you've... Where's it coming from? Where's oh, it coming hi. From? Right here. here. <laughs> <laughs> so right. you were talking about the industry, industry rejection rate or how people are more de de declining these solutions because they're afraid of their job loss. So would you say that currently in this industry in the next foreseeable 10 years that change management is a huge consideration to these solutions? and that there's a more emphasis on explaining how employees within these companies can be involved with these solutions that would make them more at ease? Huge. Change management is going to be absolutely humongous. I think people have to realize that we always talk about these jobs going away, but that's not a true statement. Some jobs will go away, sure, but new jobs will be created and other jobs are going to change. That doesn't, that doesn't necessarily mean. I think the banking industry was a great, my favorite one is the ATM example. People hated the ATM. There was a, there was a fantastic photo of the first ATM, um, Barclays, 1967 in London, and there's a mob of people watching it. Bank tellers rioted. They were pissed. They're like, this machine is going to take my job. But as more ATMs came into existence, so did the rise of the, the job of a banking teller. It just changed what they were going to do, and we need to keep that in mind. That being said, I have seen change management very poorly, organized, uh, poorly done within cultures that are adopting analytics, and I've seen it done really, really well, and you can't underscore the importance of that. I would suggest to you on that one, and I think it's a smart, very smart statement, is it's on both behalf of the analysts, like the folks perhaps that we manage, but also the folks who consume uh, analytics. So to be a, an analytically driven company and have an analytically driven culture, you need really good analytical IQ. So the change management is, as is necessary for executives and leaders and people who consume it as it is for the proficiency of the analysts themselves. And just from my experience, the change management to the heart of your question you got to have a very, which we do, have a very disciplined approach to being able to educate them on what is test and learn and what is good analytics and why would you set up things this way and what happens when you put it in, like the whole gamut of questions and education because the only way to get them to the other side of consumption and thinking analytically is through that. So I think we tend to pick on the, the uh, grand swath, which is the analyst, but many, I think they'll get there a heck of a lot easier than a company will get there. And so if you, if you read any of what Davin Ports written or competing on analytics or analytics at work or any of the any of the thinking around that it's really moving everybody else and I say that with respect it's not that we in this room don't need to move but I think there's an awful lot of work that we need to do to in, in, influence a company to get to a different place to be analytically mindful and that's actually on us because they're not going to wake up one day and realize that they need a test cell that's bigger than what they thought uh, that's got to be that's got to come from us and, and, and the vast majority I'll tell you of my job is in influencing people to think analytically outside of my own shop. I think Bob, you maybe had a comment or somebody down at that end. I don't know if you want to do the <laughs> I have, uh, Sarah, a slightly less uh, sanguine view of it. Um, I do believe there will be significant loss of uh, manual uh, job and planning job and management job. Change management is required only to the extent that the company hasn't already uh, chosen to outsource. You know, very, very few companies change manage their vendors. So if they're outsourcing analytics or they're outsourcing um, delivery like Amazon does to other folks, don't think for a second that is Amazon 
automates a little bit more to figure out how to deliver with drones that they're going to change manage all the independent contractors who drive and deliver things. So the fundamental thing maybe is a little bit less about kind of corporate Canada or corporate America and, and you know, folks are working office jobs, but the radical number of folks who are working in jobs that very likely could be automated away uh, because of good and desirous changes in efficiency. The downside to that is a societal issue much more. So change management, but maybe at the cultural level and at the government level more so than at the individual company level. Uh, <clears throat> thank you so much. So I have a little question regarding uh, hedge fund and uh, security market. So do you think it is more important to have a financial intuition or do you think it is more important to rely on data? I mean, data analytics or your financial intuition? Well, the easy answer is that you need both, right? Um, so, <laughs> and indeed, uh, you know, I have uh, uh, people I work with um, who are um, very good in uh, data science and who are very good in machine learning, but they don't have, um, you know, sufficient knowledge in the financial market. Uh, you know, you, we have to provide that knowledge to them, otherwise the project would not be successful. On the other hand, there are people who are, you know, perhaps been uh, in the financial industry for a long time, but they are not uh, familiar with the nuances of cleaning data, of setting up machine learning models, and, uh, you know, they need to be um, brought up to speed in those aspects, those technical aspects as well. So uh, the simple answer is that you really, you know, the future of the, uh, the investment professional need to be both domain expert, domain expert as well as data science and uh, AI expert. Hi, good. Uh, Good morning. Uh, my question is uh, regarding uh, capital markets, and one of the concerns that is there is uh, algorithmic trading, and uh, how much of uh, trading and transactions are actually done using computers and machines. Now, I've been trading myself, and one of the uh, problems I'm encountering is the cost, because if you're a small trader, the cost aspect. So my question is, as the algorithmic trading um, evolves, is it going to be more accessible to smaller people at a lower cost, or is it going to be something just uh, reserved for big firms? Um, well, it is um, more accessible. It, uh, certainly, um, I'm sure that um, more and more broker will ro roll out their robo-advisor and their uh, um, the uh, AI-assisted um, decision-making uh, software to all their customers at sooner or later. I, I, I'm sure that's going to happen. Uh, but, uh, but as I said, uh, there is a um, different aspects of using AI uh, for investment decision-making. If you are looking to, uh, for example, using AI to look for new trading opportunities that no one else has discovered, uh, that is going to be... Uh, uh, more harder and harder as as more and more of these AI services be proliferate. You know, they are, uh, it is a zero sum game if you're looking for um, arbitrage opportunities. On the other hand, if you're looking uh, to uh, use AI for portfolio optimization and risk management, uh, those are, um, you know, the, those are not zero sum game, and that would certainly help the individual investor uh, better avoid risk. Uh, so it's just, you know, and it, it, a lot of that doesn't even require AI. Um, you know, there are simple ways to say that. Well, you know, if the market is volatile, you should lighten up your position and so forth. Those simple analytics that are you know very well publicized, but they are not being you know incorporated in uh, uh, you know brokerage. Uh, uh, assisted uh, investment decision making program and those will be available. So I, I think in general uh, it is going to make 
it's safer for investing uh, with the advent of AI and popularization of AI.